to you all. Thank you very much for coming to my session. Um, just to explain, the Schumacher Institute owes its history to the same Schumacher as Schumacher College, but we are not the same. We are cousins of each other. So, uh, we are the kind of research part that uh, I came along and started running some courses. Uh, so we do also run courses, but we're not quite the same as Schumacher College. Um, just a little bit about me. I know a tiny bit about your sector. I was once an FE governor uh, and frustrated to hell and resigned because I just could not get through to I just hated what the principal was doing and had no, had no control over it whatever. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what it's like to be a governor. And uh, subsequently, uh, I've been a university lecturer and turned around a business degree at last five university. So I've got a little bit of experience of standing in front of classes and administering and dealing with quality control and all that stuff. Um, but what I do now is entirely to do with what I call systems thinking. And my aim today uh, is to introduce you to the subject of systems thinking. Um, so, yeah, if I could have the next slide, that's great. I think you can just hit that. So I'm going to echo, actually, what some of them um, was said in the plenary sessions downstairs, especially David Rook, who I've been a fan of for a long time, but have, this is the first time I've actually seen him speak. And um, so I'm going to introduce you to the idea of systems thinking by starting off by asking you how you currently see the world and how we currently see the world, and then lead into uh, what I think systems thinking is, and I say that advisedly because you will not find any two people who think systems thinking is the same thing. Uh, if you get into systems thinking, if you're not already into it, you will eventually have to come up with your own definition and work with that because there is no universally accepted definition of what systems thinking is. But what I think you really want is to go away with a few things to how could I make this work in practice. So I've got some little things I'm going to give you with a small handout. Just some very, very simple things that you could try out, and simple as they look, and they can change the world. Um, so uh, I'll come round to those. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use an exercise to engage you a little bit. I'm afraid we haven't got time to ask who's here and to have introductions. Sorry about that. And I'll try and make it as participative as I can, but I'm a bit up against it as regards time. I usually run uh, eight day courses in systems thinking today. I've got you know, the three quarters of an hour, so I'll do my best. Um, and uh, I'm going to use an exercise just slightly, I hope, to get you to engage. So if I could have the next slide. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I think you hit the wrong. Yeah, okay. So, what I'd like you to do is just briefly turn to the person next to you and just quickly, I'll give you a couple of minutes, we haven't got much more time than that, come up with what are some of the things that you would want to consider if you were going to answer that question? What are some of the factors, issues and so on that you would bring to mind in order to answer that question? Okay, so speak to the person next to you. <laughs> So, what kind of things are coming up? 
it's how, when you think about answering this question? Health. 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 Okay. Anything, any aspect of health? Uh, omega-3, less saturated fat. Sorry? Say so, again. Uh, less saturated fat, more omega-3. Okay, yeah, so things to do with fat and uh, nutrition, yeah? Yes. Okay, lovely. Healthy for, healthy for the eater or for the fish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> healthy for the eater or for the fish? Yeah, good question. So uh, I assume you mean for the eater, do you? Yes, for the eater, for the, for the person. Yeah, great. Well, but also my well, the excesses of eating too much fish. <laughs> Lampreys having bumped off King John. So <laughs> what would too much fish look like in a, in a, in a diet? Okay, so too, too much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. And what other things would you consider? Because environmental, so you might, are there enough fish to eat? Are there enough fish? Okay. Sustainability. Okay. What's another word for that? Sustainability. Yeah, so sustainability. And when people talk about sustainability in relation to fish, uh, they tend to talk about sort of stocks. Are there, are there sufficient stocks? Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With a lateral. Are you hungry? Yes. Oh, am I hungry? Am I hungry? Yeah. Am I not hungry? So I'm not going to eat fish. Okay, fine. Yes, yeah, good one. Yeah. 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 Socially responsible. Socially responsible. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, well, in this country, we don't like eating horses, but the French do. Um, it could, it, people just might turn their nose up at the idea that it is disgusting. Right, so sort of culturally, culturally is it yes, offensive yes. in some way? Yes. Yeah, okay, so sort of culturally acceptable. Okay. Okay, any others? Ethics? Yeah. Ethics? What, 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 what aspects of ethics are you thinking of? Killing fish, do they kill pain? Yeah, so the, the, the pain of the fish. Yeah. Right. Is it still alive? Yes. <laughs> 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 But also, I suppose, around um, fishing quotas and throwing back huge amounts of the catch because they're not yeah, survivable. Yeah, so, so um, can I put that alongside yeah. the stock, so the quotas, um, overfishing, yeah. Any other factors? Also, taste. Ethics, the, uh, taste. Does it taste, taste good? Taste, mm -hmm. taste yeah. yeah taste. So let's put that along with the, am I hungry as well, taste. Anything else? Bones. Bones. <laughs> 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 Bones in the fish. Um, we also consider cost when they afford the fish. Cost, yes. Right, so price and cost. So there are some economic factors. Yeah, what are the alternatives? What else is on the menu? Alternatives. Okay, so I was probably for today we've, we're getting a good <coughs> idea that um, there's no simple answer to this question, would we say? One thing you haven't asked me is where do these fish come from? Um, so some people would distinguish between farmed trout, freshwater trout, and North Sea cod, for example. So, um, but what we're showing is that it's not easy just to say there's a clear, simple answer to this question. So actually here, you've done something which many groups that I've asked this question of before don't do. Um, Whose perspective, whose perspectives have we got here? Consumer. Sorry? Consumer. Human. Consumer. Human. Human. Consumer. Consumer, okay, great. Consumer, even better word. Um, so, yeah. Who else, what other perspectives? The fish. The fish, fish. The fish exactly. So you have actually identified the fish as a perspective, <laughs> uh, which many groups just don't do. So when we, you know, I'm sure fish don't really think of themselves as a stock. Um, and whether or not they're tasty is not, not of a concern to the fish. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't, there are not food chains and we shouldn't eat food. But do the fish themselves have rights in, in this? Uh, and should we be in any way taking account of those rights? So that's kind of where I'd like to begin, really, because um, I'd like to come back and I'm going to gloss over this a bit because David Brooke has made that nice and easy, easy for me this morning. Um, is come up the next slide? Is so? How do you see the world now? As a very 
there were, one of the initiators of systems thinking was a guy called Churchman, and he very simply stated, systems thinking begins when we first see the eyes, see the world through the eyes of another. Systems thinking begins when we first see the world through the eyes of another. So here we're seeing the issue of whether we should eat fish. Should we be looking at it from the perspective of the fish? And when we look at it from the perspective of the fish, are we seeing the same as when we purely look at it from a health, are there alternatives, is there enough? Do we come up, do we get some different sense of our relationship with the fish? So um, I just, I'm going to slightly go over what David said. What are you paying attention to at the moment? Yeah. And what are you not paying attention to? Well, don't list it, because it will take you <laughs> um, But the point is that, can I have the next slide? There's a very useful um, device which goes with what David was saying in the session downstairs, which is Chris Agaris's ladder of inference. I expect you've come across him. He designed things like double loop learning. And, um, he's got had a lot to do with learning theory. But basically, um, there we are surrounded by possible things that we could pay attention to. Um, and we do, we select out what we are actually going to pay attention to. And so on what basis do we select out? You are selecting me because of some set of pre-existing assumptions and beliefs that are in your mind about this sort of setup. You all come from this world. Uh, you know exactly what it means to array people in rows and stand somebody like me at the front. Basically says, here's expert, we're passive listeners, this is how we do learning. Um, so you are using a belief set already to add meaning to this situation. This is a classroom. Um, and you're making assumptions based on that, probably something like, well, as he's the guy at the front, he probably knows what he's talking about. And for as long as he seems to know what he's talking about, I'm going to sit here. But if he doesn't, I'm going to get twitchy and even possibly decide to move. But the conclusion I'm going to draw for the moment is that it's worth sitting here, because so far he's keeping me engaged. I'm roughly interested in what he's saying. I think he might have something more to add that I could find useful. Um, so I then believe that I'm in the right place, and this is going to be worth my while, and I act accordingly. I stay in my seat, is to the fore. But if something were to occur which made you change that, and you thought, well, actually, I no longer believe that I'm this, this is a use, good use of my time, you would then act accordingly and get up and go. So here's a good moment for you to <coughs> exercise that choice if you want. Um, now, the point about this is that there's a, what's called, and this is a big, something that comes up a lot in systems, there's a feedback loop in here. So that as your beliefs cause you to act in a certain way, you then select out the data that fits with that set of beliefs and assumptions. And you continue to act in accordance with that narrow view of what, what's important in the world. And of course then it confirms you, because if you sit here long enough and hope you go away having learned something or got something useful, that's told you that it was worth your while to sit in this format, whereas, and not to get up and start shouting and tell everybody that this is a lot of rubbish and do something very different. So we're constantly being reconfirmed in, in our beliefs. So my first question to you is, what is your own set of assumptions and beliefs? And amazingly, I was only really asked this question in 2009 when I was on a wonderful master's course at Bath University. And I have to say, I don't think I have really fully sat down and engaged with myself to answer that question before. So I suspect if you're feeling the same, you're in good company, because it's not a question that we're asked very often. Um, and when you do ask it of yourself, well, for me, it was quite extraordinary <coughs> to find that what I thought I believed in and what I thought were my values, my assumptions, the things that I held dear, Actually, there was a lot of dissonance between that and the way that I was acting in the world. And since that time, I have been trying 
to act in the world more in accordance with what I hold to be my assumptions and beliefs, which is why I now teach systems thinking and don't work in the university. I won't say any more about that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you your sort of first experiment, and actually um, David Rook produced a paper with somebody called Bill Talbot, um, and these, these, uh, this next exercise is contained in that paper, if any of you, it's called, it's the paper by Fisher, Rook, and Talbot, if any of you want that at any time. But what T Talbot asks us to do is to notice how you're being. <laughs> Now, at the moment, I am exclusively, and thank you very much, very kindly, advocating. I have the floor. Um, it's very nice, you know, it's good for my ego, all that sort of thing. But basically, I am just giving you the benefit of my opinions and my ideas. And you, at the moment, and for as long as you can last in the stuffy room, are recipients of it. <coughs> now, we all tend to have, is there any chance we could just turn the meeting on? We, um, we get to hear a lot of advocating, and a lot of leaders are darn good at advocating. In fact, they'll tell you exactly what it is that they want their organisation to be doing, and it's time you went out and did it. And the old finger comes up. This is the advocating finger. And when somebody asks that excellent question John says about vision, vision is very often saying, me, the leader, has heroically come up with how this college is going to go in the future, and from now on, this is what we're going to do. And if anything crops up that doesn't fit with my plan, tough, we're still going to bash on with it. Now, that's a bit of a traditional route, and many, many leaders have come away from that kind of command and control idea. But there is a tradition, and it's still taught in business schools, I used to teach it, that that's how you do management. So what I'd like you to do is to try a little experiment and experimenting, as we heard downstairs, is a big part of systems thinking. I'll come back to why that is. And I'd like you to try out, next time you're in a meeting with a group of people, is to try inquiring. The main word here is to try out shifting from advocating to inquiring. Now, I'm not saying that advocating doesn't have its place, it does. Um, you know, if the ship is sinking and you need people to get into the life boat, you know, so I wonder how you all feel if we um, <laughs> got a workshop together and discussed. If you, obviously there are times when you do advocate, aren't there? But what also, what I'm suggesting is you experiment with a shift. If your normal mode is to advocate, how about experimenting with asking some questions? A really good question to ask is, how do you know that? And one of the things we find in systems thinking is, what are the sources of our knowledge? We are very, our learning background is very much about this sort of learning, isn't it? It's about the expert. We have to write our essays saying, this expert said that, and that expert said that. And when I, again, when I did this marvelous master for the first time, and I've done several courses in my life, for the first time I was allowed to write in the first person about what I was experiencing, what was my relationship to what I was learning. And this was a complete revelation for me, it was amazing. Because up until that point, everything had been over there. My relationship to learning was something that was over there, uh, mediated for me by experts, objective. And of course, actually, we are part of what we know, <coughs> and what we know is part of us. So deny it as we may, I would say we have a subjective relationship with what we know. We have a relationship with what we know. So a very good question to say to you is, how, how do you know that? So if somebody's banging on about something in a meeting, or indeed you're banging on about something in a meeting, and you say, actually, how do I know this? What's my source of information? How do we know about fish, the state of fish? I mean, the state of fish, people tell us, is terrible. You know, we're going to run out of fish, we're going to destroy our oceans. And I believe that, is that the right word? I accept that because I'm told it by a scientist who've researched it. But should I? Is that right? How? And 
And I feel the climate changing. I say that word deliberately. I feel that something's happening. I sense. So I've got another way of knowing, which is my own in here, my intuition, my emotions. Um, I can know by this just the feeling that goes through my body, as it were. But do we allow ourselves to bring those things up? If someone comes into work on a Monday morning and says, in the bath at the weekend, I had the most amazing idea, and we've really got to do it. Some of you will say, well, what's the rationale? How do you justify it? So if we have a lovely intuitive insight, we usually then have to frame it in some acceptable way before we can use it. So the reason I put framing and illustrating there, framing is when you put a bit of brackets around. So if you were going to say to somebody, how do you know that? You might first of all say, because you're used to me banging on, I'm going to do something different today because I'm trying out an experiment. I heard this chap Martin Sandra from this course. So I'm just letting you know that that's coming up, okay? And just to give you an indication of how this might work, you then might be able to tell a little story which is just illustrating what you mean. Before you hit somebody and saying, how do you know that? Do you see what I mean? So the framing and the illustrating is just to kind of present the picture of what you're going to do. So my first suggestion to you is that you experiment with this and then you just notice what happens. If you slip back into advocating, that's fine. Just notice. Don't say, ah, you are useless. I've gone back to advocating. Just take the judging bit out of it. This is something we try to do a lot in systems thinking. Is just notice what's going on without trying to define it all the time. Just describe it. Oh, that's interesting. I inquired, and within 10 seconds, I was back to advocating. Good deal. I'm going to have another go tomorrow and see what happens. So that's my, my first suggested exercise for you. So my, this is a way of you testing out for yourself what some of your assumptions and beliefs are. Because if you move away, if you've got a fixed set of assumptions and beliefs, of course you advocate them. And I'm suggesting that you move away to asking people, because what you're now doing is trying to, to bring in something to do with their assumptions and beliefs. You're actually trying to see the world through from somebody else's perspective, which is the beginnings of systems thinking. Now, what we'll then find is that actually we have a collective way of seeing the world. Um, I do a whole talk on this, um, which is why since Francis Bacon, Galileo, Copernicus, and so on, we've found ourselves drawn into what I call a very mechanistic and scientific way of seeing the world. Now, that's not a criticism, because it's brought fantastic benefits to us, but it's also brought and is increasingly bringing side effects, and this is why there's a lot of talk about system thinking now, to try to move away. But I would suggest that we have a kind of shared worldview, which could be called heroic, um, but certainly mechanistic, where we see mind and body as separate. We see human being and nature as separate. Um, we are very reductionist in the way we do things. So if we want to understand something, we tend to take it apart, um, to understand what it's made up of, um, which is a very reductionist, mechanistic way of doing things. Now, of course, it's not exclusively true. We work in other ways as well, but our sort of prevailing way of thinking is to do with this scientific method, empiricism, positivism. And if you just want to explain to yourself why this is, imagine what it was like when Copernicus came along and said, actually, we're, we're all completely wrong about this. You might look out of the window and see the sun doing that every day, but that isn't the sun going round us. It's us going round it while spinning at the same time. And there were people at the time, leading intellectuals, the sort of Dawkins at the time, who said, I don't care what these mathematicians say. You've only got to look out of the window to see what the sun is doing. And yet, Copernicus and Galileo later were saying, look, stop the world. We're all wrong. We're all wrong. We can no longer believe what our eyes tell us. 
And that's when empiricism started. Francis Bacon was the father of empiricism, English thinker. Uh, Descartes said you know, that the universe is entirely mechanical, mathematical. Uh, nature is to be beaten and conquered. Um, and I think the thing that distinguishes me from all other creatures in creation is that I think, I have rationality, uh, and everything else is for the beasts. And from there grew a whole movement which is to do with that separation, the, the, lead, the power of the expert over the, over the personal, if you like. So we, and we've had 300 years of that, and it has brought us fantastic benefits, but it's also locked us into a way of thinking. This is how I feel, and many, there are many people around who, who rather share this view. It's locked us into a way of seeing the world that's very mechanistic. And that flows into how we do leadership because we can easily be seduced into the idea that our organizations are some sort of machine and our people in it are sort of cogs in the machine. And we talk about structures and organization charts and, and we use lots of mechanical metaphors to describe it. And then our leadership comes about how do I structure things? How do I this, make this machine work, and how do I get the organization to be a well-oiled machine? We hear that, don't we? Um, so this mechanistic worldview is, is very deeply embedded in us, and it takes a heck of a lot to kind of find a way over it. I, I've, you know, I've been living with this stuff quite a lot of years now, and I'm still, still just the same. Um, in fact, on the way up here in the train this morning, uh, the sick, you know, there was I, I was part of the railway system, and uh, one assumes that the railway system is beautifully simple, you know, signals, nice long wires and signals and rails and engines and all that stuff. But of course we came out of Reading Station and they said, well, I'm sorry, but the signals are broken. Um, and there was I immediately going through my, I must let go of the need to arrive on time. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, this is an emergent change that I am not comfortable with. Um, and uh, in systems, we realize that things are constantly changing uh, and things are emerging. And if we're leaders, we've got to be prepared to say, good heavens, that's wonderful. A new thing has emerged. What an opportunity. Or at least, let's not try and, you know, there's no point in me saying, well, I've got to be at Paddington by 8.40, because otherwise I'm stuffed. Well, I wasn't then, I was in terms of time, but, you know, I couldn't be saying to the railway people, I've got a contract with you to get me there for 8.40, and woe betide you if you don't make it, because they just weren't going to make it. I had to let go of that, because we arrived till 20 past nine. So, there's something in systems about being ready to engage with what emerges, and let go, very often let go of the need to be right, which was, I think, what um, sorry, I've got my name down. So yeah. was saying that you know, prepare to admit that we might be mistaken. So let's just move on then. I, I've suggested that we each of us have a worldview. We have a way of seeing the world, a set of assumptions and beliefs. That we collectively have a set of assumptions and beliefs. That <laughs> even if we use other, even if we are systemic and emergent and all those things, we nonetheless find in our meetings and in our papers and in our working situation that we have to conform with a way of, you know, if we want to do something, we have to justify it, we have to get the budget together, we have to go through with all the Ofsted rubbish and, you know, the measurement and all these things that are, are, are all born of that mechanistic paradigm, I have to say, really strongly born of that paradigm. And, and the sooner we can shift, or at least get a mix of that and something else, the better in my view. But, um, Let's just think about systems a minute. Give me some examples of, of systems. Where does the word system crop up? Sorry, you're all asleep. I have to talk to you. Sorry, any, any IT. IT system. Yeah, great. Okay, IT system. Just chuck out any example. Sorry? The circulatory system. Transport system. Transport system. Banking. Banking system. 
central heating. The central heating system. <laughs> right. Huh? The government, <coughs> the government system. system. The education system. The telephone system. The solar system. The digestive system. <laughs> Are you getting any sense of what's happening here? <laughs> We've only got one word, damn it. <laughs> and it covers all sorts of things. It's the most enormous set of brackets. It's terribly annoying. So when I say I'm a systems thinker, usually people think I'm going to come and teach them computer programming. Um, but did you hear amongst those systems, we're going from the deeply mechanical. A computer is a very, very logical instrument. Um, it literally adds one and naught together, doesn't it? So it's just it's very, very logical. And you have to break everything you want to do through a computer. You have to break it down into those steps. It's extraordinary what they'll do for this when you think about it. You know, but, and then you've got things like the, the telephone system. Then you're getting into a slightly different nature of system, like the digestive system or the circulatory system. And then you're getting into whopping great systems like the universe. You know, so that's the system within which we all exist. So the first problem we have in systems thinking is this word systems. If you go to the thesaurus, they either don't put it in there at all, because they can't think of anything to, to uh, any other words for it, or it only has about one or two words with it, whereas if you go to the, you know, thesaurus for love or something, you've got half a column, which is nice, nice thought. So we're, we're all the time a little bit constrained. But basically a system is any series of interrelated activities that are producing some kind of result. Or not. <laughs> it's probable that a system is going to have some sort of purpose. And it's probable that if we want to deal with it, we'll have to put a boundary around it. So one of the first things we have to think about in systems thinking is, what are the issues around boundaries? So let's try one out on you. Where would you probably put the boundary of your, <coughs> as in the beginning and end? Where would you put, let's not worry about the end. Where would you put the beginning of your digestive system? Right. Your mouth. Which is a perfectly, you know, obvious place to put it. <coughs> so then I would say to you, why do you cook? And actually, cooking is part of pre-digestion. So you are deliberately breaking down the food to make it more digestible. Now, it doesn't mean the mouth is wrong. It just means that if I put the boundary in a different place at the cooking, I'm dealing with a different system. And now I might then say, why do I shop in the way that I do? So if I put the boundary out in the supermarket. So the boundary is, there's no rule about it. It's just, once you've placed it, you need to be aware that it's not, what we tend to do in mechanistic thinking is put a boundary and then only think inside. So what's the most likely boundary of the college? Probably. Go on, give me a clue. How do you think of the boundary of the college, the most obvious one? The grounds. The grounds, okay. The grounds or the walls of the building, probably. And of course, there's a tendency then, once you've described that as the boundary, to only think inwards. Whereas actually a boundary is a point of relationship with that which is beyond. So my mouth might indeed be where we decide to put the boundary, but then we have to think about what's the relationship with what goes beyond. And if you think about the college and you take away the boundary, you just think of it as actually interactions between young people coming to learn, or not, not so young maybe, and teachers coming to learn or teach or whatever they do, and then lots of other things. And you take away the building, does that actually immediately start to say, I wonder where I really ought to put the boundary? Where is actually the boundary in relation to a college? Is it in the student's home? Is it, where is it? Do, do we need one? Uh, what's the effect of putting it? <coughs> so what, we've got systems, and then we've got systems thinking. So, no, thank you. So I would suggest that systems thinking is a sort of way of being. It's a way of seeing the world. Um, and it has to do with using a range of senses, not just the expert. It has to do with being inquiring, curious. Um, maybe I can have the, maybe I'll have the next one. So 
E.F. Schumacher, who was the author of Small is Beautiful and various other wonderful books, said we need to look at the world and see it whole. So this is where he would start. He, he never said he was a systems thinker, and I think he might have been not very happy with the, with the term either. But he's essentially saying, look, we need to look at the connections. We need to be understanding this in this wider, interdependent, interrelated way as we possibly can. And as I said to you before, a very good way of doing that is to try to see the world through the eyes of someone else. Um, and that was Churchman's suggestion. So let's use another example. Um, what is salt? So what have we just done? Nothing wrong with that, that's what it is. But what have we, what's been our approach to understanding the salt? Reductionist. Reductionist, yeah. We've just taken it to pieces and said, it's, and, and that's absolutely in, a, a lovely indication of how we, we work. But actually, what is salt? Seasonal. Seasonal, yeah. It's got some quality, hasn't it, salt? It has an emergent property. Do you remember sodium in the labs at school? Mm -hmm. And chlorine, well, we weren't allowed to touch that because it's too dangerous. Right? So why is it that sodium and chlorine, these two extraordinary elements together, and then you get the emergent property of combining those two is you get, you get salt. And you know, what is salt to us? It's absolutely invaluable. <coughs> um, or glass, say. What's glass? It's basically sand. It's hot sand. It's what do you think of the emergent property of glass? I think glass has played more of a role in separating us from our environment than any other material, because there it is, forming a wall, and you can't even see it. This, I had a big re revelation about this a few years ago. Glass, just extraordinary stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely a wall. It's, it's preventing us from being whatever's going on outside, and yet we can still see outside. So we have this kind of separation. So things have emergent properties quite other than how they're constructed. So a big thing about systems is what's emerging? Why does the college that you've got or the organization that you're part of, why is it, why is it like it is? How come when you put all those elements together, you're getting what you're getting? And if you're a humble leader, you'll say, I have no clue. <laughs> so then you've got to think, so now what do I do? So let's just move on to the next one. Some of the aspects of the sort of systemic <coughs> way of being are to do with being in core. That why question. Why is my college like it is? I know what I'll do. I'll go and ask all sorts of different people what they think this place is and how it works and how they see it. Because systems thinking begins when I first see the world through the eyes of another. Students, people in the kitchen, people who clean, teachers. That was the reason I left Bath College. Because no one was asking the staff what their idea was about how we save money. They were just being told. You know, we're going to get rid of you. Nobody said, look, this is what places us. You're all intelligent people. Have you got any suggestions? Nobody ever asked them that question. And if we're dealing with things which are complex, we need to be open. And this is uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable. Especially if you're an achiever. Um, are we all very hot? Yeah. Um, so what, what we're wanting to think is there are lots of different ways of knowing. There's our intuition, there's our feelings, there's stuff we get from places we're not sure where. And then of course there's expert and there's research and there's evidence. Um, and there's what I feel about this and there's the kind of objective, if there is such a thing, reality of this. How do I look at something from multiple perspectives, inner and outer? And how do I, as I'm going about my life,
hold some awareness of my own assumptions and beliefs, because everything I look at is affected by my blinkers, my way of seeing the world. So how do I, how do I break myself out of that all the time to say, actually, that's just my way of seeing it coming up, um, which maybe isn't isn't that helpful. So systems turn out to be self-organising, believe it or not. So your college is just self-organised. Don't know how much work you do to them. They just get on and do it. You know? So it's, then it's a question of, well, what's my intervention mean? I've got this urge to intervene because I'm paid all this money to intervene and do stuff. But actually, is that the right thing to be doing? It seems to be self-organising rather well. Um, you know, I wish people would leave the health service alone because I'm quite sure the people in it would. Anyway. Um, and they're what's called um, auto, autopilotic, which means they, they self-start. And they're what's also called dissipative, which means your organisations constantly change, and yet they stay the same. Or they stay the same, and yet they constantly change. So your place of work probably have a sort of culture a way of being and doing and a feeling that may have lasted for years, and yet staff have been coming and going, students have been coming and going. Somehow this entity that emerges from all these interactions has its own sort of life. So as a leader, you're asking yourself questions about, gosh, how does this work? And what, what actually do I do in it? Uh, and should I intervene? And if I do intervene, will I know what happens? And is it worth it? If because the mechanistic says, if I pull this lever here, those people will do that over there. Or if I press this button here, this group of people will respond in this kind of way. And of course, they turn out to be human beings, and they turn out to be rather complex. So, the, um, how am I doing on time? A couple of things. One is, there was a guy called Gregory Bateson, and he said, we need to really have a kind of big shift in the way we see things. And the biggest shift was, so you, he used the example of someone cutting a tree down with an axe, but I'm going to use the example of, you ever sailed a dinghy? It's that thing in the boat with its sail. What, what's more useless than a boat with its sail up, gone off from the dock with no one in it? You know, it just, do any of you know about sailing? Too many. Yeah. I'll, I'll try a bicycle then, maybe a bicycle. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what, what's a bicycle? How do you get to understand a bicycle? What's the best way most of us would understand a bicycle? Well, ride it. Brilliant. I love that. That's the right answer. But actually, I don't mean the right answer. That's a good answer. Good answer. No, um, <laughs> we, we, many people would take it to bits. And so then you've got on the floor, or you, you're trying to understand it in terms of its mechanical but let's say you do do that, and then you put it back together, so you've got a bicycle. Have you still got anything that's useful? So you lean a bicycle. Well, first of all, you have to lean it, don't you? Can't. It doesn't stand up on its own. What is a bicycle? It's only any good for getting It has potential, doesn't it, but as itself. So what does a bicycle need to become a rider? It needs a rider, but be a little bit more detailed than that. It needs propulsion. It needs propulsion. What else? Energy. Balancer. Huh? A balancer. Balancing. Balancer. Yeah. Balancer. It needs to be able to stay up. It needs a way of going forwards. It needs a navigation system, so therefore it needs an observation system. <coughs> and what do we usually give the bicycle to allow it to have all those things? A human being. But we see it generally as bicycle and human being. And Bateson said, we need to break out of that because actually, as we get on the bicycle and ride it off, a new consciousness emerges, a new system emerges, which is a combination of the bicycle and the propulsion and navigation system that's on it. So the, it's the bicycle that now has a brain and eyes and hands and muscles. And we've now got a new system transcends the bicycle and the human. Now, I'm not being, not meaning to be rude to you, but I don't expect you to fully grasp what I'm saying, because you, know, you think I've gone off on a woolly jump over trip here. But just have a think about this over the next few days, and think to yourself, 
What does he mean that some new sense of self emerges from this combination? That isn't me who's on the bicycle, and it isn't the bicycle, it's somehow us. And you think about that in some of the contexts within which you work. So Bateson argues that we keep generating new systems of which we are a part. So um, I want to send you away with some sense of, well, how can I make use of this? Well, first, yeah. the first thing is, we said, didn't we, earlier, there's lots of different kinds of system. And this convergent and divergent comes from Schumacher. And then there's a guy called Dave Snowden. And in fact, if you want to look something up, I think you all might find quite useful. Go onto the internet, and under Dave Snowden, you can see how it's spelled there. Look for something called Knevin. If there's any Welsh people in the room, I do apologize. But that's a Welsh word. Knevin. Knevin. Thank you. Oh, great. At last, somebody's told me how to search for it. Knevin. Yeah? Or Knevin. Anyway, what he's saying is that systems fall into four types. Simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. And Schumacher says, on this side, problems are convergent. And on this side, they're divergent. Sorry about my writing. Not very good. And don't ask me up in north and south because there isn't a distinction. Simple is like a bicycle is a simple mechanism. A jet engine is a complicated mechanism. What do I mean by that? It looks to anybody who's not a jet engine designer complex beyond belief, but it isn't complex. It's complicated because it's predictable. It does what you expect it to do unless a bird flies into it or something happens that's not expected. If it's performing normally, it doesn't have any unexpected emergent outcomes. Its emergent outcome is it creates thrust. Right? The jet engine system creates thrust. That's what you expect it to do. Complex, on the other hand, is like get some human beings involved and you've got complexity because you're getting unexpected emerging outcomes. You put a group of people together, you don't know what's going to come out of it. Things emerge. And if you're running a service organization, my goodness, you're dealing with complexity all the time. And despite what you think, there'll be very few processes in your organizations that fit into complicated. Convergent thinking from Schumacher's point of view is where there is a solution, if we do enough analysis and we think about it hard enough, we can come up with a single point solution and that will solve it. So if there's a problem in a jet engine, we spend enough time looking at it, we'll find the problem, we can mend it. Divergent means actually there isn't one answer. There are several answers. And we, they, you know, like there are lots of dis political disputes, aren't there, between how people see the world. They're never going to come to agree with each other because they just fundamentally see the world differently. So then we have to deal with that divergence. And Schumacher argued that we spend a lot of time in management trying to drag what are complex problems into the convergent and then apply simple solutions to complex problems. And then we wonder why it is when we pull the lever that we thought was going to give us such and such a result, we've got something completely different happening. And this is, I think, where the humility comes because we have to say, look, I'm a heroic leader paid goodness knows how much every year. I'm supposed to be able to solve things. But actually solving things is not the finding the single solution. The solving things is helping us all together to get a grasp of what this complexity is and what the heck are we going to do about it. Now, usefully, Snowden suggests, in here we've got things like quality management, process management, repetitive jobs, so we treat them in a repetitive way. In here, we've got things like Peter Senge's, um, I, I'm having one of those moments. I know it really well, but I can't think of it. Um, 
systems dynamics, which is mostly quite mechanical, but it starts to pay some attention to the human aspect. Over here, we've got things like soft systems methodology and so on. So there are tools that we can use in these different circumstances. But the main tool that I want to send you away with here is what's called action experiment. And this means that you you get yourself yes then, you get yourself into an experimental mode. And it means this this word isn't here by accident, action. It isn't just about experiment. It's not about sitting in bed experimentally <coughs> thinking of things. It's about going out into the world and trying out something different. Now that can be dangerous, obviously it can. And so it requires a systems thinking mentality, as it were, the systems thinking approach to be prepared to do that. It involves reflecting alone or with others on what is the nature of the problem to identify the questions that are arising. What is it we want to know here? What's going on here? Why are we getting this result? And then from that question, identifying something that can be done in action to find an answer to that question. And that involves doing something experimental. Now the whole idea of an experiment is that it can fail, or it can go wrong, or it doesn't go according to what you expected, or you learn from it. And that's the emphasis I would rather put on it, is that you go about the place experimenting in order to learn. And that learning builds a picture of what this system is, so that you notice what's coming out of your action. Inner, what happens in here, and outer. So when you try your, your framing, illustrating, and inquiring instead of advocating, notice what happens to you. And notice how other people are towards you. And it's very good to keep a little bit of a journal around that if you can be bothered. Just noticing, not saying, oh, it was terrible, it didn't work. Saying, oh, it's really interesting, you know, quite a mistake. I completely lost my temper. Um, you know, wasn't that interesting to notice that that's what I did? I wonder what that's about. Maybe that could lead me into some other experiment where I could learn about why I lose my temper when I find I'm letting go of the need to be right. And you do this in cycles. Now, I've, I'm giving you a two-minute lesson on something that's difficult to learn. There's lots of literature, which generally is called action experiment, but they call it action research. So if you know, but action research has got all sorts of meanings, and in education it's been used for what's essentially reflective practice, I think. So I've kind of moved away from that term, because it's got quite a lot of baggage with it. Because I think experiment really tells you what it's about. And this is what we try to do when things are so complex, we're trying to learn how they work, and we're trying to find ways of making them work better. We need to do some experimenting. Now, you'll immediately say, well, hold on a minute, we can't experiment with building a new building, or experiment with a new time, you know, can't just say the timetable, we've got a new timetable this term, and we'll, it'll last until Wednesday, and then we'll change it. <laughs> Obviously, that isn't far. But of course, <laughs> even the timetable has emergent properties, does it not? And uh, things happen in the time. We like to think of the timetable as a structured thing. But of course, then someone doesn't turn up or, or we double book somebody or whatever. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you know, every, the whole world goes into meltdown and you start experimenting with everything. But it's just to kind of develop a way of being in yourself that is experimental. Because the thing I read, the main thing I'd like you to go away with that systems thinking is, it is letting go of the need to be right. And I, I've been a leader, I've, I've run organisations, and I was just advocating this to anybody else. And I just, you know, I thought, this, that's my job to be right, and I'm going to be right. Even when I was dead wrong. I'd like to go back now and run organisations. Sadly, I think one of the consequences of making it to strategists is that you don't want to be bothered with it anymore. Uh, which is a little bit of a tricky one. But, um, <clears throat> so letting go of the need to be right can be, I think, a major skill. And the, the other thing I, I've got to hand out <coughs> to you, the other thing I'd like to send you away with is where am I in this? This is such a... <coughs> we're left
letting go of this idea that things are happening over there. In systems, I am a part of every system that I engage with. So if I see a system, I must, in some way or other, have that system coming through me. Don't worry, I've nearly finished if you're getting hungry. Um, so I'd just like to just wait a sec till I say. Do you remember we had it up? Oh, not that? Yeah. Oh, he's broken. Yeah. Not to worry. Not to worry. Do you remember we had it up? Should you eat fish? So I want you to think of that question. Should you eat fish? Now, when the slide comes up, read it and see what's the difference in yourself. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm going to stop there. There's a hand up here. If you could, this is just to sort of give you a bit of um, sort of aid to do some of the things I've suggested. I, I'm going to do a plug for myself here. I run a course called Systems Thinking for Effective Action. It's spread over six months because we only have time in four two-day workshops. If any of you are interested in that, it starts at the end of January. I've run it several times. It's highly regarded. Can I say that myself? <laughs> Anyone who's been on it has been transformed by it. So if you want to get more yeah. deeply into systems thinking, then please help yourself to the shoulders. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.